this part here is called the auxiliary section. Now, the way to think of this is you think of the audio path as like an MRT line, okay, a train line. Each of these blue knobs and the white knob is like a station. So the sound can get off the main line at any of these stations and go on to a branch line. Okay, it's a bit like changing from MRT to LRT. So you think of this as MRT. The blue and the white is like LRT, smaller lines going off. Okay, so if the, the knob is all the way down, then the station is shut. Okay, nobody can get off. As you turn it up, you divert some of the sound. Okay, now the reason that we need this is that we often have other destinations that we need to send the sound to. Allow me to explain. So you have this speaker that's hung up here, all right? And this is called house or front of house speaker, right? And this is for the audience to hear. Right? Everyone knows this, right? We've all seen PA systems like this. Good. Now, the question is, can the performer hear the front of house speaker? Not really. Eh? He can hear the low and low mid frequencies that come off the back. But if you've ever stood behind a speaker, you will know that the sound is not very clear coming from the back. And there's a good reason for that. So how can he hear himself? Excellent, right. So you have to put another speaker on stage pointing at the artist, right? And these are called? Good, well done. Okay, so these are called mons or monitor speakers, all right? So you now have two separate sets of speakers. You have front of house and you have monitors. So you need a way to divert the sound to go to the monitor speakers. That's where the auxiliaries come in, okay? So in a typical band situation, you will have different monitors on the stage, okay? So let's say we have a stage, all right? We have, we have drums, right? Maybe we have bass, we have right, keys, we have a, a lead singer, right? And maybe we have a, a guitar player, all right? Each of these people needs to be able to hear, okay? So, you know, you have, a, you have a speaker here, you have a speaker here, speaker here, speaker here, and then if the drummer's lucky, we'll have one there. Each of these people needs to hear a specific combination of sounds. So, for example, the lead singer, right? What does the lead singer need to hear? Exactly, right? So, singers must hear themselves. Otherwise, it's like trying to sing with your, your fingers in your ears, right? So, lead singer needs to hear himself more, first and foremost, all right? Chances are he can hear the drums because the drummer is right behind him, right? Probably can hear the bass from the bass amplifier and so on. So many lead singers, they want only their voice in that monitor, okay? So this, this combination of sounds that he wants to hear is referred to as a monitor mix, right? So maybe you assign him one, right? Then the guitarist will call it two, right? Keyboard, maybe we'll call it three. Drums and bass, maybe four, right? Because drums and bass typically need similar things, okay? So you can see that you have four different monitor mixes here. And that is why you have so many of these. So you can see on this, you have three blue and one white, okay? So this is why you have these extra stops on the MRT line. Does everyone follow that argument? Yeah? Okay. And the idea is that when you mix a show, you are not just controlling one mix, right? The faders are one mix. When you control this, you are controlling what you hear, right? Yeah. 
When you control these, you are controlling what's on stage. It's not always like that, but generally speaking, faders are for front of house. This one, okay? And the knobs are for here. All right. So this brings us to the concept of this pre- and post-fade auxiliary send. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this adapter, okay? I'm going to unplug from the left speaker, excuse me, I'm going to unplug from the left output and I'm going to connect this to the AUX2 output. Okay. So now obviously, check, check one, two, you, you can hear that this speaker is no sound now, right? Because I unplugged it. Okay. So I'm going to bring this fader all the way down. No sound because fader is all the way down. I faded out that speaker. Now I'm going to bring, this is in AUX2, I'm going to bring my AUX2 master up, okay? This is the master for this output, same as this is the master for the, the front of house. Then what I'll do is, I will bring up my, sorry, wrong channel. I'm going to bring this up, check, check, one, two, check, one, two. So you can hear that there's sound, all right. Notice that the fader is still down. This configuration is called pre-fade aux send, all right? And the logic is that no matter what you do with the fader, so now that speaker's starting to make sound, no sound. Notice that this does not change, yeah? And the reason for that is that when you are mixing a show, you are constantly making small changes here, right? You don't want the guy's monitor to be getting louder and softer. You would drive him crazy. Okay. This allows us to have a signal on stage that is constant. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to press this button and you notice the sound has disappeared. Okay. Now what we'll do is we'll bring this up. Okay. Check, check, one, two. Check, one, two. Notice that the sound has come back. So now, this is tracking the fader. Check, one, two. Check, one, two. Check, check, one, two. Check, one, two. Okay? This is post-fade auxiliary send. Okay? Monitors are generally run pre-fade. And there is a use for the post-fade. But, you know, this, this can royally confuse some people. Again, your, your seniors will guide you when you actually when you actually implement that. Now, that's a very good question. It depends on the mixer, okay? On this mixer, all of the aux sends are post-EQ. So, in other words, the changes that you make here affects what the artist hears on stage. On the more expensive boards, it is switchable. Related to this is what happens when we turn the channel on and off. Do you think this still works? Let's find out. So it's on. I'm going to turn the channel off. Check, check, one, two. No sound. Okay? So you must remember that the channel on off affects all of your aux sense as well. Right? So if this is off, everything dies. And there's a very good reason for that. In live sound, if you have a feedback emergency on stage, you may not know which of these five speakers is feeding back. So it's good to be able to just turn everything off. Okay, And if it's in the middle of a song, uh, sometimes just turning it off for half a second uh, can be enough to deal with the problem. Okay, So same thing, you notice if I bring up the fader, no sound anywhere. Okay, If I turn it on, now we have sound in both speakers. All right? So the last thing, all right, we've covered this. Um, this red knob, this red knob is your pan control, okay? Listen, so check one, two. Yeah, over on the left, check one, two. Over on the right, and this is call center, right? What, what's the point of having this? Uh, any, any, when, when would you use this pan control? Uh? When do you want like, only half the audience to be able to hear stuff? Uh? No, yeah, a, a number of you are shaking your head, right? So the, the answer is that in live sound, we almost never pan stuff to hard left or hard right. And the reason for that is that typically the audience on the left side can't hear the right speakers, all right, and so on. The, the exception to this is when you have a stereo source, 
that is connected to two mono channels. Now, this is not the correct connectors, right? But this is just for illustration. So, some mixers have no stereo channels. The Mackie is a good example. So, when you bring a stereo channel in, you must connect it to two mono channels like this. All right? Again, this is just for illustration. So, when you do this, you will pan the left signal, hard left. So, we find 11. You pan this hard left and the right signal hard right and your pan controls will look like this, okay? This will create the correct stereo image. If you leave them in the middle, what you are doing is you are basically turning it into a mono signal, all right? So that's an example of when you would pan them. So you have on-off switch, we've explained that. This peak light, okay, um, I didn't cover it just now but if you turn, check one, two, if you turn your gain too high, you can see that I'm right at the top of the meters, okay? Can you see the peak light is flashing, okay? This serves to warn you that you are driving the channel into distortion, all right? And this is a very ugly sound, so I'm going to turn the channel on. I'm going to bring the fader up just a little bit so you can hear what it sounds like. Okay, so check one, two, check, check, one, two, check, one, two. Right? That's not good. Okay? You do not want to hear that. So that's what this, this P, if, if you see this thing staying on, you must bring your gain down. Okay? If it flashes now and then, it's okay, but it must not stay on. Okay, below that, you have. 1, 2, 3, 4, and ST, and PFL. You guys probably noticed that there are a couple faders here that are labeled group 1, 2, and group 3, 4. Okay, so at this point, it's important to understand that once the signal gets to here, it goes across and it goes out of the mixer. There are different ways that you can route it. If your ST, ST stands for stereo, Okay, if your ST is down, it goes directly to this one and it goes out of the board. That is how you will operate 90% of the time. Okay, so you must double check that this is down. If it is not down, the signal goes nowhere. All right, these three switches say when the signal reaches the bottom, where do you want me to go? All right, so make sure your ST is down. The other two, group one, two, and three, four, serve to allow you to group or to segregate your channels in a certain way, okay? Why would you want to do this? Let's say that you have four backing singers, okay, on the first four channels. You do the sound check, you discover, okay, number one is quite soft, number two is louder, number three is in the middle, number four is like real soft, okay? So you have them all nicely balanced. Let's say that during the concert, uh, you suddenly discover, oh, they are all just a little bit too loud, right? How are you going to deal with it? You could try and bring all the faders down, right? But then chances are is that you will lose track of the relative positioning. So what you can do is you can group them into a single fader. So what you do is you, you unassign them from ST, and you press in one, two on all four. Then what will happen is that these four will go here. And from there, you send them to ST. All right? So that means that, say, all your backing singers are too soft, go up a little bit. All backing singers too loud, go down a little bit. All right? So this is the live sound application. Typically, you have two of these. You can use, say, one, two for drums, you know, three, four backing singers, or some engineers prefer one, two is all the instruments, three, four is all the vocals. Okay? It's up to you. Now, the recording guys will use the groups to send to their recorder. These have outputs on the back of the board, so they are separate group outputs, okay? If you look at the back of the board, you'll see that it says aux 1 to 4, and then the bottom it says group out, okay? The group outs can be used in a similar way to the auxes to send signal to other destinations. 
Um, typically, you might use them. The, the auxes are used for stage monitors, right? The groups, maybe you use them for front fills or um, delays on bigger systems, that sort of thing. All right? So that's what the groups do. If in doubt, make sure that your SDs are all down, okay? Yeah, even on the, the larger boards, I personally don't use groups all that much, okay? Um, the exception is where you mix stuff like, for example, musicals where you have an orchestra and you sometimes need to turn the orchestra up or down or something like that. Okay, the last one, PFL, we know fader. The only other thing that we need to understand is that the fader should usually be somewhere near zero. Okay, this is called unity. Um, you will see some engineers where their faders are all way, way down at the bottom, okay? This is not good because it means your gain is set too high. You'll see other engineers whose faders are all way at the top. Again, that one, chances are gain is too low, all right? The middle of the fader has the greatest resolution, meaning that it gives you the greatest precision when it comes to adjusting the sound. At the bottom, Moving just a couple mm, you'll get 10 dB of change. All right? Good.